One of them greets Lenok, asking if he is 484 and introduces himself as number 482 named Miguel. Lenok realizes he is on a team with them and confirms his number as 484 and introduces himself as Van. Miguel then introduces the other two as Ericsson and is interrupted by their fourth member, who introduces herself as Claria. Miguel then suggests they should get going and they agree to proceed. As they move, Lenok observes that these three already know each other and assesses their magical abilities. He concerns that they only possess enough mana to enhance their physical strength. Hoping they won't hinder him, Lenok joins the other mercenaries as they make their way toward the undeveloped district. Miguel casually asks Lenok if he finds it fortunate that they aren't far from their destination. Lenok, displaying a lack of enthusiasm, reluctantly agrees. It is revealed that the undeveloped district includes areas in the upper 50s and some districts whose members haven't even been decided yet. It is a vast area consisting of ruins. In the past, due to the rapid expansion of Balkan City, the city government had ambitious plans to expand the residential area. However, after failing to manage the districts in the 40s, the districts in the 50s were essentially abandoned. Meanwhile, Claria remarks that it must be hard for anyone who works outside of Balkan City, mentioning that they say the contamination trouble only worsened recently. However, now they have to go back and forth to the city with those dangers nearby. Ericsson chimes in, considering they feel sketchy when looking at the factories and buildings built outside the city. Meanwhile, deep down, Lenok agrees and reflects on his experience working in the factory, contemplating that the factory made the corpse pulverizer of the Dark Mages to sell. Conversely, Miguel considers that to mercenaries like them, it's not necessarily just a lousy thing that undeveloped districts exist. According to him, it's not easy to come by quests where one can earn a million cell just for hunting when the contaminated. Ericsson mentions the usefulness of his shotgun particularly against larger adversaries. While Claria turns toward Lenok, noticing his sole possession, a revolver, and remarks that it seems to be his only equipment. She asks him if he utilizes any other gear or weaponry during his missions. Lenok realizes that's what they have been wondering and considers that he has no reason to hide, so he informs them that he studies lightning-type magic. Miguel anxiously asks if he means pure elemental stuff, and when Lenok concurs, stating that they could say that, it takes them aback. Miguel remarks that they are mistaken, prompting Lenok to wonder in what sense. Miguel explains that they assume he was a mage who learned a more common type of magic, mentioning that mages who work alone usually work on skills compatible with all kinds of teammates. Meanwhile, Lenok inwardly considers a feeble excuse and ponders that he did hear that pure elemental mages are unwelcomed when they are beginners because they could harm the team's efficiency. However, he finds it strange for them to exclude him so obviously and wonders if they were planning this from the start. With that in mind, Miguel asserts that they need to rethink working together, as they would prefer to work with someone who can support them. Lenok then counters by questioning Miguel if it was mandatory to be in a four-person group to get a reward for this raid, to which Miguel remarks that he didn't think so, stating that some people might still get injured or die because of this exchange. Lenok concludes that trying to collaborate when their objectives differ will only result in stress. He firmly asserts that they should separate at this point, as working together doesn't seem feasible when their goals are not aligned. As Lenok turns around to leave, Miguel asks if he is sure that will be okay. Lenok gazes at their relieved expression, so he responds to his query that it would have been much nicer if Miguel had asked him earlier, acknowledging that he may have made things complicated. When Miguel dismisses his assertion, stating that he couldn't be so blind, Lenok retorts that they will separate here and suggests they must put some distance between them to pursue their hunting endeavors. Claria sarcastically appreciates his decision, while Miguel mockingly believes that Van must have a plan. As Lenok departs, he feels annoyed by the situation, realizing that it would have been foolish to fight to prove his strength, and in the end, he would be the one losing out if he worked with a team. On the other hand, Claria ponders why Miguel is staring at Van, emphasizing that they got rid of a hindrance as having a parasite like that in the group is annoying. Ericsson agrees to Claria, emphasizing that it's already irritating just thinking about joining the mercenary community raiding team as they don't have the time to worry about a weakling like Van. Furthermore, he assumes that Van will probably crawl back to the city once he figures out how hard this job is. Meanwhile, Miguel contemplates that this is what they wanted, but wonders why he feels unsettled. It is as if Van chose to quickly distance himself from them. It may be because he has superior magic skills, and if it is the case then they might have lost a valuable connection. Conversely, Lenok assassinates a beast with his lightning bolt magic and remarks that it looks more disgusting in real life. He remembers Dylan's explanation that the contamination initially emerged approximately three years ago from a large-scale project in the undeveloped districts known as the Black Consumer. This project, purportedly the root cause, involved the creation of poisonous living weapons on a significant scale. 
The project was initially aimed to control viruses with strong proliferative power to increase cell regeneration explosively, and was meant to test the possibility of immortality, but ended up birthing contamination instead. Furthermore, it is said that if one is infected, all the cells in his body will replicate exponentially, leading to the individual's explosion. However, the biggest problem is that the corpse leaks a black fog, a remnant of the experiment's failed technique. This black fog floats around seeking living beings to inhabit. Lenak exhales a sigh and grasps his knife, considering that he doesn't want to, but they said to bring its eyes as proof of having killed it. As he prepares to take them out, his attention is diverted to the horde of beasts, but he remains unfazed, ready to confront them, referring to them as dogs. Lenak mentions that he was already tracking the contaminated through mana detection, so he is prepared to greet them. He then swiftly unleashes the gravity bind maneuver, which binds one of the beasts, while the other attempts to attack Lenok. However, it proves futile, as he has already prepared a magic barrier shield around himself to prevent any precarious situation. Lenok uses his mana imbued bullet to kill that one as well. Using additional magical maneuvers and demonstrating his adept skill in magic, he successfully Lenok subdues five beasts. Nonetheless, he finds the task of collecting their eyes to be tedious and bothersome. He gathers them in a pouch and contemplates that they said it's a million cell each, but he has earned five million now. He acknowledges that while it's not a wrong way to earn money, it's not something he wants to do long term. According to him, without his detection magic and a two kilometer radius seeking out the contamination, it would have been annoying. The contaminated are not as weak as he thought, their movements may appear straightforward, but these creatures possess an unexpected combination of swiftness and formidable strength. Lenok realizes that the reason mercenaries were grouped in four might be due to the overwhelming nature of the task. He assumes that facing these creatures alone would have been too challenging for individuals like Miguel or Erickson. Pondering this, he takes a deep breath, contemplating this situation while holding his viper close. Reflecting further, Lenok questions whether his companions were cognizant of this fact. If they were, it would imply they intentionally abandoned him to face potential danger alone, possibly assuming he was a feeble mage. He considers that their departure wasn't entirely unexpected. After a small break, he resumes his quest, searching for the next target. His goal for this job was to earn at least 20 million cell, the amount he needed to buy this demonia from Starnia Pharmaco. As he roams around in search of more contaminated beasts, Lenok realizes the necessity to eliminate more of them to reach his financial goal. He estimates the current pace and speculates that achieving this target might take approximately two days. Reflecting on his choices, he realizes it would have been wiser to take on a quest that offered upfront payment. However, he sighs deeply, acknowledging that dwelling on such regrets serves no purpose at this stage. Sensing the looming presence of contaminated creatures nearby, Lenox swiftly pivots, activating his mana manipulation abilities. Using his magical prowess, he detects the presence of three contaminated entities confined within cage-like metal boxes. Discerning their locations through his supernatural senses, Lenox recognizes the situation. He concentrates his mana, realizing he possesses the ideal magical spell for dealing with this abandoned building. Drawing upon his knowledge of summoning type magic theory, he employs a maneuver known as lightning tracker magic and summon lightning magical foxes. Although he can't grant the magical foxes their own will, this spell boasts a remarkable duration and proves suitable for the current scenario. While the magical foxes lunge toward their target, Lenox senses someone's presence, which bewilders him because until now he hasn't felt any presence. It is just like his past encounter with a sniper when he was unable to detect the sniper's presence. He notices a person hastily running and wonders if this individual is the same sniper from that previous encounter. He plans to halt that person with a sound wave maneuver, but to his surprise, his magic doesn't affect the blue-haired girl and she keeps running. Lenok remarks that she is good enough that sound waves won't work on her, so he unleashes an ice burn maneuver to halt her. The girl gets startled to witness ice arrows coming towards her. Just narrowly evading the ice arrows, the girl is stunned to discover herself still alive as the ground erupts in a fiery explosion. However, her sense of relief is short-lived because suddenly the ice bursts again and grapples her legs, rendering her unable to move. Lenox steps towards her, acknowledging her skill, thinking that would not be able to hold her, but determined he won't let her have any rest. As the girl discreetly tries to grasp her gun, Lenox swiftly employs gravity bind magic which shackles her hand, prompting her to yell in frustration and cursing that she had to cross paths with someone like him. He wonders if she is screaming and cussing from their first meeting, and then tosses her gun aside using his magic. She pleads for leniency, but Lenok, inhaling Viper, questions why he should relent. Perplexed, the girl questions what she did to deserve this treatment. Lenok counters, mentioning her attempt to flee when he discovered her hiding. In her defense, she explains that she aimed not to disturb him and emphasizes her intent not to interfere with his hunting pursuits. 
Lennox sarcastically dismisses her statement as convincing. She asserts her belief that he doesn't trust her but appeals to him, asking if he could at least remove the ice underneath her, as she feels like her toes are on the verge of freezing off. Despite thinking she won't resist, Lena can't comprehend what she is thinking, so he brandishes his gun at her. In a state of panic, she abruptly calls out Dylan, which startles Lenok. She reveals that she works with Dylan and states that she is just a regular mercenary. Surprised by her revelation, Lenok surmises that she must have connections to Antares if she's associated with Dylan. He inquires how she knew about his acquaintance with Dylan, wondering if Dylan mentioned him. As she confirms his suspicions, Lenok becomes curious about her motives for following him and asks how she escaped his mana detection skill. She assures him that she had no intentions of causing harm, she had been in close proximity and wanted to avoid getting entangled in anything. Her decision to hide stemmed from that desire to remain uninvolved. Stressing her point, she mentions that if she had hostile intentions, she would have attacked him first as she would have enough time. Regarding her ability to evade his mana detection, she cryptically mentions that she would just say that she did it with the power of money. Perplex, Lenok inquires further, prompting her to reveal a charm hanging from her waist. She elaborates that it's an assimilation charm crafted by an advanced druid, emphasizing its high cost and value. Suddenly, Lenok seizes the charm, prompting her to protest loudly, demanding its return. Druid nature type techniques derive their strength not from an energy form, but from the unwavering faith nature's creatures holding them. As a result, their abilities leave no discernible trace or sign of their presence. Lenok acknowledges the logic behind this, understanding that such power would be imperceptible to him. However, he notices that its pattern is fading and realizes that his own presence is also becoming fainter. Lenox speculates that this ability functions only when someone remains in one spot. Given the symbol's fading pattern, it likely has limited uses. He doubts she would have attacked him with such a crude item. Amidst it all, the girl nervously smiles and asks Lenox if he plans on returning the charm to her, highlighting its exorbitant value. Lenox gazes at the charm and admits he can't promise its return. However, he consoles her, saying not to fret, affirming his intention to make good use of it and eventually return it to Dylan. In frustration, she exclaims that Dylan, that bastard, doesn't even know what's within his own wallet. However, after some reluctance, she finally agrees, acknowledging that it might be simpler to let it go. Unexpectedly, she becomes excited to find that the ice is melted, allowing her to move her feet. However, she expresses displeasure at the water seeping into her boots and queries Lenok about his intentions to address this inconvenience. In response, Lenok asks if that's what is essential right now, with her hands restrained by the gravity bind. She presses on, asking what comes next, reiterating that she had already assured him she had no hostile intentions toward him. Meanwhile, Lenok contacts Jenny to inquire about a blue-haired mercenary woman in Antares, and Jenny confirms her existence. However, their conversation is abruptly cut short due to a terrible signal, likely because Lenok is on the outskirts. Despite the interrupted call, he reflects that he checked what needed to be checked. Lenok then diminishes his gravity by maneuver, freeing her hands from the effect. He then asks for her name, and she introduces herself as Camilla, adding that he can call her Mila. She then asks if he is Van, asserting she has heard plenty about him, retrieving her gun from the mud. Mila questions if he came to eliminate the contamination. Lenok counters by asking if she isn't here to do the same thing, and she confirm agrees, revealing that she has needed some quick cash lately. Mila adds that the boss was saying something about the deep web and how they can't take quests for a bit, so she came here instead. This revelation prompts Lenok to delve into deep thoughts, and he remains silent. Anxiously, Mila asks what's up, and if something is wrong, but Lenok denies her assertion. Mila then shares there is a way to eliminate a bunch of the contaminated at once, seeking his help, and asks whether he is interested. Mila proposes splitting the money 50-50, and asks for his thoughts. Instead of agreeing to an equal split, Lenok offers her 70 to 30 ratio, which infuriates her. Anxiously, she asks what she should live off, to which Lenok responds that since he would be killing the contaminated in the end and has more responsibilities, it's reasonable for him to take a larger share. This only intensifies her frustration, and she sternly questions the fairness of the situation, emphasizing that the idea was hers and urging the importance of upholding business ethics. She then suggests a 60-40 to 40 split as a compromise, expressing her inability to compromise further and deeming it a fair arrangement. Lenach comments that he is uncertain about the idea is that much brilliant. Nonetheless, he agrees to the 60 to 40 splits, which startles Mila. Anxiously, she urges that he can't change his mind later on. Enthusiastically, she turns around, urging him to get moving. When Lena questions if they'll have to walk, she dismisses the notion excitedly. She reveals that she had retrieved something earlier, claiming that she will give him a nice ride. 
Later, they ride on the forklift truck, and as she drives, Lennox sarcastically remarks that it goes better than it looks. She reveals that she had just retouched some of the wires, and it started working again. Suddenly, Lennox's attention is diverted to a contaminant, and he abruptly attacks it with his lightning magical fox, which pursues the contaminated creature and overpowers it. Lennox then collects the creature's eyes. As he rides, the Vita Kolki inquires where to go next. Miller responds that she wouldn't know, but the contaminated usually search for signs of life to chase after. To her surprise, Lennox already knows that it's the place where vagrants live. When Miller ponders if he already knows, Lennox clarifies that he just assumed. Then he contemplates that it's not like he hasn't thought of the possibility of vagrants living out here, except looking for them is almost a waste of time. Lennox then asks her if she hasn't considered that other mercenaries might have the same plan as everyone is probably around that area. He then moves to disembark from the vehicle, stating that if Mila doesn't have an alternative plan, she should drop him there. She anxiously halts him, stating that he has so little patience for a mage and assures him that she is aware of that and reveals that she kept a secret that no one knows about. She says that her boss, Antares, has much interest in the vagrants, so she has to volunteer sometimes because of her boss. As per Mila, they help the vagrants move and they are the only ones who know their current location. Lenox considers the possibility that if her words are valid, they won't encounter any other mercenaries which he deems as not necessarily a bad outcome. Upon reaching the location, Mila adds that the contaminated creatures likely haven't found this place yet, as the vagrants must be caring for the ones that come near. When Lenox asks if she hasn't gone inside the building, she remarks that if it weren't for his boss, she wouldn't even go near them and would instead go around with scavengers. She halts the vehicle there, stating that they should wait here for a bit, adding that they don't see any contaminated right now, but she is sure they will come here drooling. However, her attention gets diverted to a group of people arriving at their location. Observing them, she remarks that there seem to be more than 10, but they are too far away for a clear count. Lenoch informs her that there are 18 in total, and they are all mercenaries. Mila then expresses her disdain, mentioning that she came here precisely to avoid encountering any of them. Lenoch responds, suggesting that if they know how to handle mana, it probably had an easy time finding this place. As he consumes his viper and exudes mana, she asks if he is going to fight them, asserting that they arrived first and can probably tell those mercenaries to leave. Lenoch responds that it would be nice if they just listened, revealing that he knows some of them. Mila finds it nice, suggesting they can ask them to leave politely, but Lenox denies it, stating that he doesn't know them that well. As the mercenaries approach them, Lenox's former team members are shocked to see him there. Miguel comments that they have re-encountered each other, noting that this place seems smaller than he had imagined. In response, Lenox concurs. Miguel then asks Lenox if the person next to him is someone he has been with all this time, and Lenox responds that he met her on the way. Miguel sarcastically remarks that it is good as it is dangerous to go around alone. When Lenox asks what he is trying to say, Miguel explains that they had their eyes on this place first. Trying to be friendly, Miguel suggests to him that they could relocate elsewhere if it's okay with Lenox. However, Mila intervenes and firmly questions if Miguel is out of his mind. She asks what kind of nonsense he is spouting, urging how can this place be his to take when no one owns this land. Miguel starts to explain that when a mercenary claims a spot first, but before he finishes, Mila angrily interrupts, shouting at Miguel, asking if this is his place. She emphasizes that she was the one who assisted the vagrants in relocating here initially. When Lenox attempts to calm her down, she urges him not to stop her and brandishes her gun at Miguel. Frustrated, she tells Lenox how she cannot be pissed when the ones who arrived after them are telling them to leave. Miguel sternly remarks that she should calm down as they can choose the violent route too. Lenox calculates that there are only two of them, while nearly 20 mercenaries are on Miguel's side, so if the fight begins, they have the advantage. Meanwhile, Lenox wonders if that guy believes in the strength of numbers. He then uses his magic to assess the mercenary's mana, thinking if they fight, the first one he would need to take down would be the blonde-haired guy as he doesn't feel a presence or any mana from him. He wonders if he is so skilled that he can hide them all. Conversely, that blonde-haired guy named Melrin steps ahead and suggests Miguel should stop right there. Melrin realizes that Millet is from Antares and remarks that he never expected to see an Antares mercenary here expressing his pleasure to meet her. He introduces himself, revealing that he is Norn from Platon and is guiding these mercenaries today. Miller realizes that Platon is another mercenary office that works alongside Antares in this field. They are set to scout talented mercenaries using their incredible wealth, although she doesn't know where they get their money from. Miller then states that everyone knows Antares is interested in the undeveloped districts, and he assumes the residential area here is also Antares' doing. He adds that it would be rude to ask her to leave this place when she is from Antares, as he humbly asks whether she at least permits them to rest a bit, when she anxiously asks for rest, Melrin concurs, 
adding that if they come across some of the contaminated creatures, they can get rid of them. Lennox realizes he is telling them he won't leave and contemplates that if they react aggressively to this, it will lead to a fight. Sensing Mila's reluctance to confront Platon mercenaries, Lennox then calls Mila and tells her that this is where their deal ends, prompting her to wonder why this sudden turn of events occurred. She halts him from taking such a step, emphasizing that he should keep to his words. She asks him where he thinks he is going on his own like this to which he ponders if she wants to compete with those guys and says that going around alone would be much easier than that. Mila offers him the charm she purchased for 10 million cells to persuade him to stay, proposing it as an incentive if he cooperates with her. Amidst the conversation, everyone's attention is diverted to the horde of contaminated creatures rushing towards them, catching Miguel and his comrades off guard. Mila turns to Lenach anxiously, asking if he is still leaving after watching all that. She implores him to try this out together as he doesn't have anything to lose and ensures him that they can outmaneuver those adversaries while they are at it too. As Lenach observes the situation, he senses something amiss and contemplates that if there are a bunch of living beings here for so many contaminated to appear all at once. As he gazes at Miran's malicious grin, Lenach realizes his decisive plan, suspecting that they are somehow involved as the situation doesn't seem like a coincidence but rather intentional. Realizing the imminent danger, Lennox then advises Mila to take her shotgun and run to the front immediately, assuring her that he will take care of the rest. Mila gets his plan and abruptly sprints to heed Van's advice, catching the attention of other mercenaries, prompting them to wonder about her motive. Meanwhile, Miguel and Claria command the rest of the mercenaries to chase her. But before they can move any further, Lennox swiftly unleashes his sinkhole maneuver, a magic spell used to create a small hole. He expands it by channeling more mana into it and as a result, a pit hole emerges beneath the mercenaries, causing them to fall into it. Lenat wishes they would stay down there, but he acknowledges that won't happen. Suddenly, he becomes surprised to see Moran's body exuding mana and realizes he is hiding it. He then grins and unleashes a maneuver that interferes with the opponent's mana flow. In that instant, they use mana. It breaks it. Meanwhile, Moran kneels in excruciating pain as his mana refuses to move his body trembling uncontrollably. He soon realizes it's as if someone is forcibly controlling it, and he attributes it to Mage Van's doing. Feeling more confident in the success of his maneuver, Lenok notes Moran's considerable power. He assumes that if it works on him, it might affect others too. Consequently, he employs the same maneuver on the other mercenaries, leaving them bewildered and unable to move their mana. Miguel can't fathom how it happened and asks Lenok for help, explaining they can't get up there as they can't move their mana. When Lenok doesn't respond, Meron sternly calls out to Miguel, questioning if he still doesn't understand. Miguel becomes startled upon realizing that Lenok is responsible for their predicament. Lenok then unleashes his magic fox maneuver, startling everyone. The summoned magical foxes rush to aid Mila, hindering the advance of the contaminated creatures. She recognizes these foxes as belonging to Van. She attempts to shoot one of the contaminated creatures, but unfortunately hits its eyes, which were crucial for their payment. In the heat of the moment and excitement, she can realize that she messed up her shot and instead find it impressive. Frustrated, Lena pats his head in dismay, realizing she wasn't supposed to shoot out their eyes at that moment. Mila sadly acknowledges her blunder. However, instead of letting her mistake overwhelm her, she resolves to stay determined. Refocusing her aim, she confidently sets her sights on the creature's bodies, determined to shoot accurately this time. On the other hand, Mira manages to get out of the pit. He briefly gazes at Lenok, and without uttering a word, he sprints to confront the contaminated creature. Melrin's nonchalant response prompts Lenok to wonder if he is leaving without confronting him. He speculates that Melrin might have recognized who was disrupting his mana earlier as he seems intelligent enough to avoid fighting against him. Amidst the chaos, the other mercenaries somehow climb out of the bottomless pit. Erickson confronts Lenok angrily, questioning why he stood by and watched, stressing that he could have offered help. Lenok pretends to be unaware of Ericsson's accusations and implies he doesn't understand what Ericsson means. Lenok reveals that his priority is assisting the woman with the shotgun, indicating he doesn't feel obliged to help anyone else. He asserts that he doesn't consider himself friends with the mercenaries, finding it strange that they suddenly expect teamwork. However, his statement infuriates Ericsson, who impulsively lunges to attack Lenok physically. Lenok remains unfazed and unleashes the elemental magic he tested after seeing Grimes shockwave magic. This prompts Ericsson to tumble aside and spew up. Lenok then employs lightning bolt magic, rendering Ericsson unconscious and catching his comrades off guard. After a while, as Lenok walks aside, Miguel inquires why he had revealed his skill earlier, suggesting they would have treated him differently had they known. Lenok sternly responds that he didn't come to the undeveloped districts seeking special treatment and praise. Meanwhile, Mila and Marin individually continue to overpower those creatures, 
Conversely, when Lenok reminds them of their earlier agreement to tally their kills, Claria requests him to wait. She remarks that she doesn't know about Miguel but doesn't consent to that agreement and intends to explain further. However, before she can complete it, Mila, thoroughly drenched with the creature's blood, intervenes. Mila sarcastically remarks that she understands that Claria needs money, however, she criticizes the notion of abandoning their teammates to prioritize personal gain. Claria attempts to deny Mila's accusation, asserting she wasn't thinking that way. In response, Mila sternly questions Claria's intentions and says were not she thinking to herself that it would be much more profitable for Claria to align herself with the mage rather than her friends. Feeling ashamed, Claria reluctantly admits that Mila's observation is correct and Mila mockingly pats Claria's shoulder. Meanwhile, Marin arrives and acknowledges his defeat. He expresses that he cannot even be angry because Mage Ran is mighty and commends that what happened today was very impressive. Marin extends his business card to Lenok, mentioning that it's the only thing he has to offer, and asks if Lenok would accept it. Lenok understands that Marin doesn't wish to continue arguing about the contaminated creatures and agrees to take his card. In response, Marin expresses his gratitude to Lenok, hoping for the chance to meet him again later. As they calculate their kill count, Mila becomes frustrated, having taken down only 7 creatures while Lenok managed to eliminate 12. Lenok remarks that it would be higher if they counted the one where she accidentally blew its eyes off, so it's her own doing. Despite this, he still praises her efforts, acknowledging her work. In return, Mila compliments his magical abilities and extends her hand for a handshake. She suggests he visit her sometime, prompting Lenok to wonder why. Mila explains that Dylan always talks about him, so their boss is curious and should come by if he ever needs work with fat rewards. Following Lenok's indication that he'll think about her proposal, Mila departs with a cheerful smile, reminding him of his promise. Confidently, she declares that she'll catch him next time as she takes her leave. Lenok contemplates that he got 19 million cells from the contaminated hunt, although it's a bit short of his 20 million goal. Lenok views this sum as sufficient to purchase the much-needed Starnia Pharma's miracle drug, Stamonia, and he anticipates that it better be effective. Upon arriving home, Lenok diligently strengthens the protective barriers surrounding his apartment through a focused meditation session. After completing his preparations, he gazes at the Stamonia, encased within its crimson cover, serving as a tangible reminder of the significant investment he made to secure it. Reflecting on its potential, Lenok recognizes that there is a high chance that Stamonia might not meet his expectations, as if too much energy is imbued into his body, it might have more negative effects than the good ones. Despite his reservations, he considers the slim chance of mitigating his current penalties through its consumption. Holding the Stamonia in his palm, he weighs the medicine's benefits against possible drawbacks, determined to explore its effects. Swallowing the pill, he soon feels a surge of anxiety gripping him, leaving him uneasy. He anxiously wonders if his body is too weak to handle the effects of the miracle medicine, realizing the impracticality and risks of forcibly infusing mana into his body because how crazy that is. However, Lenok realizes that this is not the time to be worrying about the mana overdose penalty. He considers that if he loses consciousness or his body temperature rises too high, he could end up dying. He decides to reinforce his body with mana and raise his tolerance. Amidst heavy sweating and discomfort, he resolves to continue drinking the fluid until his fever goes down a bit. He considers that he needs to stay awake. The following morning upon awakening, he realized he had unexpectedly stayed awake through the night. Yet, he did not feel any lighter or any other improvements due to the medicine. Examining the sweat stains on his bedsheet, he mutters to himself that he probably can't use that bedsheet anymore. He brings the bedsheet closer and notices an odor reminiscent of viper venom. He speculates whether these marks are remnants of toxic materials from the viper along with other harmful substances discharged from his body. He considers it worth the money, especially since, despite reinforcing his body with mana throughout the night, he doesn't feel sore or experience any discomfort. Initially, he would have felt like being painfully stabbed by needles as soon as he stopped reinforcing his body with mana. Since he has no symptoms, the mana overdose must have eased up a bit. Although he doesn't notice any other effects, just being able to temporarily offset the penalties is enough for now. At least he confirmed there's a way to mitigate the penalties. For a week after that, he could experience the miraculous effects of the medicine. For instance, he could sleep without taking any sleeping pills, so he felt like he was getting some proper rest. Now that he has sufficiently rested, he intends to pursue another job request. Since he spent all his money on the miracle medicine, he tries to contact Jenny, but becomes bewildered when the system notifies him that her number is currently unreachable. Lenok then plans to see her in person. Taking on Van's persona, he heads towards the bar to meet her. On his way, he notices the city is oddly quiet, realizing something's off as the internet hasn't worked. He wonders if something serious is happening. 
As he enters the bar, he asks bartender Jordan about Jenny's whereabouts since she isn't there. The bartender informs him that she was summoned and is probably at some random office. Lenok, intrigued, asks if something significant is happening in Balkan at the moment. The bartender, taken aback by his lack of awareness, wonders if Lenok had been sleeping for a week or something, as it's unusual for him to ask. Jordan explains that the Envoy group, scheduled to arrive at the end of the month, suddenly sent a visit notification last night causing chaos in Balkan. Lenok ponders if the city's silence is due to the early visit by the Envoy team and suspects there may be more to it. The bartender confirms Lenok's suspicions, mentioning that the Envoy team is composed of individuals even Van wouldn't have anticipated. Lenok is intrigued by Jordan's description and wonders about their significance. Jordan reveals that Heaven's Ribuke, a transcendental being from the lighthouse of Philanum, is coming to Balkan later that night. Lenok wanders around the city of Balkan, pausing beside a towering building. He deems it a suitable vantage point and decides to employ floating magic, despite its high mana consumption, to propel himself upwards. He is determined to catch a glimpse of Heaven's Rebuke. For a hundred years, Medria Falsier, known as Heaven's Rebuke, has served as the lighthouse keeper, diligently watching over the perils of the open sea. She is a level 9 ascendant, of which fewer than 10 remain today. If a great mage is someone who is treated like a strategic arm, an ascendant is someone who surpasses the great mage. Heaven's Rebuke is someone who truly challenges the limits of a transcendental being, and due to their intense self-restraint to surpass the limits of what is possible, they are rare to encounter. The extent of their power is indescribable in words. Heaven's Rebuke possesses the remarkable ability to cast their gaze across thousands of kilometers from where they are, effortlessly peering into both the future and the past. Madria Falsier has dedicated her life to observing the unfolding disasters across vast stretches of time and has earned her unparalleled uniqueness and reverence among her peers. As Lenoth lands on the rooftop of the building, he realizes that if not now, he may never have another chance to see her. However, his attention is diverted to soldiers, including a sniper and a signalman, who appear to be part of the specialized forces affiliated with the city government. He questions their presence in such a remote location where the city square is barely visible, understanding that it underscores the significance of Heaven's rebuke as a highly esteemed guest. He realizes that he can't knock them out or reveal himself, nor can he use invisibility magic due to the penalties of mana addiction. However, he unleashes noisy magic to erase his presence and employs illusion magic to distract the soldiers, rendering them unable to notice him or their surroundings. Lenok then proceeds unhindered, moving forward to perch on a parapet wall. With the aid of the scope provided by Jordan, he gazes downward to catch sight of Heaven's rebuke amidst the substantial crowd gathered to welcome her. Perched on the rooftop and observing the extensive involvement of government agents and the military, Lenok overhears the signalman communicating with his fellow soldiers via a walkie-talkie. They're informed that Heaven's rebuke will arrive within the next 30 seconds, urging them to remain vigilant as Madria Falsier approaches surrounded by tight security. As the Ascendant arrives at the event, the crowd erupts into cheers, some even shedding tears of joy at the sight of her. In that moment, Lenok notices her and senses something unusual. He becomes bewildered as the vicinity magic of Heaven's rebuke detects his presence. Lenok wonders to himself if one can even consider her a person or a human being. He realizes her mana is immensely powerful, capable of potentially obliterating an entire city as he struggles to maintain his sanity. Struggling to maintain his composure, Lenok wonders if Heaven's Rebuke noticed him observing her. Abruptly, he rushes away, realizing he needs to retreat for now. Suddenly, he senses her answering his question, how there can be consequences without a cause. He listens to the voice telling him that in a world where order is destroyed yet balanced, they have been attempting to answer such questions for a very long time. His existence itself is the answer to it. Her voice tells him that she finds it exciting, remarking that if others could see what she is seeing now, they would have tried to hire him no matter what. However, she knows now that all this struggle is pointless, and she warns him to beware of Alcade. Meanwhile, Lena finds himself tumbling on the ground, unable to fathom all that has happened. Madria Felsier's appearance changed many things and Lenok obtained a new goal, and that is to reach the peak of ascensions. Through that, he could find out the reason he woke up in this world. This is what he should do as he is immensely confident about it. Checking his phone, Lenok learns that, society-wise, the meeting with Philanum ended very quickly, and the city government accepted all of the conditions that the Philanum Envoy Group put out. It was decided as soon as the Ascendant decided to help Philanum. Four days later, he discovers that Madria Falsier, Heaven's Rebuke, failed to ascend and died. He contemplates that she sees into the future and the past, so he wonders why she returned to Balkan in her last moments. Later, seeking insight, Lenok discusses this with Jenny, 
who suggests that the main reason Madria Falsier sided with the Philanom might hold the key to her return. According to her, the top-secret project Black Consumer that was carried out in the Undeolup district. Evidence surfaced revealing that this project involved utilizing captives from Philanum as subjects for experimentation or testing purposes. The bartender, Jordan, intervenes, stating that the problem starts now, because the person leading the agreement is now gone. Lit enough wonders if Jordan is saying that the Balkans will go back on their word. Jordan responds, indicating that it might not happen immediately. However, the city government is unlikely to uphold this unfair agreement for an extended period. As he anticipates that they could become increasingly desperate, Jenny adds that this could escalate into a war. Lenok informs them that he doesn't think he will take any jobs today and decides to leave. As he walks around the street, he assumes that the Great Descendant created a momentary peace by sacrificing her own life. He wonders if she did this knowing it would turn out this way or if she came at Balkan because she knew about his existence to check for herself that he, a consequence without a cause, existed. However, he concludes there is no point in thinking about it as his head hurts. As he reaches for his Viper and his blazer, the Dyke Laser Cutter, which he had previously taken from some hooligans, accidentally falls onto the road. As he bends to retrieve it, an older man steps on it and refers to Lennox as a skinny bastard. Attempting to reclaim ownership of the gadget, the man angrily questions Lennox's right to pick up his belongings that had carelessly fallen to the ground. Raising his voice, he demands to know if Lennox hurt him. However, Lennox regards the man's words as a feeble excuse, finding the situation somewhat absurd and wondering if the man truly believes this tactic will succeed. Lennox gathers his magic and strides forward sternly, catching the man off guard. Seeing he is against a mage, the man abruptly kneels, apologizing and begging for leniency as Lennox retrieves his belongings. Lennox then questions the man's assertion of ownership over the item. The man agrees, stating he crafted it in his shop, making it his possession. He asks if this holds a different meaning for Lennox, suggesting that it would have become Lennox if he had adjusted it. Lennox gazes at the gadget, recalling how the hooligan pleaded with him not to point at them. The person he rescued had mentioned it was a Dyke's laser cutting machine illegally modified into a weapon. Lennox points out that if the man sells those items for money, they become the private property of the buyer. He questions why the man is now claiming ownership. With a deep sigh, the man remarks that he can't converse with those who don't understand literalism. Then he adds that since Lennox now possesses it, he is his client and requests him to visit his store if he needs anything. As he turns around to depart, the man once again apologizes to Lennox for what happened. Lennox realizes the man has left without providing any details. He acknowledges that he doesn't know the man's name or the name of his store. Two days later, Lennox hears the request had reached Jenny through the dark web. So he visits their office, seeking further details. As Lennox takes a seat, he notices a green-haired client who looks very stark. He asks the client who is exhibiting such unsophisticated behavior if he has ever seen a magician. The man remarks that it's the first time he has seen someone worthy among those mages who work alone. Sarcastically, he adds that encountering someone who is not an idiot and has a decent character isn't unusual. Lennox then asks the client if he has prior knowledge about him, sternly urging why the man acts this way with people he meets for the first time. Lennox's mana surges as he strangles the man, menacingly brandishing Dyke's cutter at him. He states that if the client wants him to take the job, he must learn tact in speaking. Lennox warns him not to get on his nerves and test his patience, his stern demeanor catching the guy off guard. Lennox contemplates that this kind of thing is obvious, this is the type who wants to gauge whether the opponent or person in front of him is weaker or stronger, and once this is determined, the priority in dealing is established. Lennox strategizes that he should pressure him at first, so he doesn't even think about manipulating him. Lennox moves his gadget aside, asking if the man understands him now. The guy sighs in relief and tries to maintain his composure, mentioning that he didn't anticipate his style to weigh heavily on anyone. Lennox becomes bewildered to see the guy laughing despite nearly choking and finds it suspicious. He wonders if the guy really came to deliver a mission and considers it as evidence that the boundaries between enemies and allies are bleak. Lennox gazes at the guy, noting his appearance resembling more of a beast than a human. The guy notices the cutter in Lennox's hand, pondering if the older man adjusted it. He remarks that he thought the man died long ago but is still alive and doing it. He then hands his business card to Lennox and introduces himself as Killian revealing that he works as part of the support company that made this cutter. Killian informs Lennox that their headquarters wants to hire him directly, prompting Lennox to ponder if Dyke is looking for him. Later, the guy takes him to Dyke's headquarters to provide further details about the mission. He then asks if Lennox knows the nature of their company's work. Lennox responds that he only has a slight understanding based on the information he heard from Jenny. Dyke initially started as a factory manufacturing industrial tools, 
Over time, the company expanded and ventured into the arms trade due to its substantial capital. Because of this, it is said to be at odds with the current arms manufacturer, at Chills. Meanwhile, as they step out of the elevator, the guy informs Lenok that if all goes well, he will be given a temporary position as part of the support team. However, Lenok responds that he hasn't heard a word about what he is supposed to do in this mission. Killian says that he brought him here for that purpose. Killian then takes Lenok into an office, informing Panwe that he has brought the mage here. However, the girl present asserts that she instructed him to call her before Lenok's arrival. Panwe then greets Lenok, expressing gratitude for his presence, and requests him to have a seat. She remarks that it's a pleasure to meet him and introduces herself as Panel Baluchi, the planning team leader at Dyke. Lenok introduces himself as Van and suspiciously inquires about her position in the company, asking if she is truly the planning team leader. The lady anxiously asks why he is inquiring about this and Lenok responds that he wants to know who the mastermind is and what he is capable of because he hasn't heard anything from this werewolf. Panwa asks if he knows Killian is a werewolf, wondering if Killian told him. Lenox clarifies that it's just his instinct admitting that he's already killed one to be honest. Panwa assures Lenox that their company strictly prohibits internal power struggles, emphasizing their commitment to a conflict-free environment while maintaining a reserved stance. Lenox intends to decide on his involvement based on Panwa's information. Panwa mentions that it seems Killian was rude to him and apologizes to Lenox on Killian's behalf. She then acknowledges Lenox's query and emphasizes that her position grants her direct authority over the company's strategic direction. Additionally, she discloses that the project was her initiative, implying a significant personal investment and commitment. According to Panwell, following their venture into the weapons industry, their company has been seeking opportunities to broaden its customer base, aiming to reach citizens in their 40s and 50s, as well as those in the outer districts. Lenok expresses his lack of confidence in marketing, to which Panwell clarifies that marketing isn't what they require from him. She explains their intention to expand their business into the 40s district, but outlines a need to address a few obstacles before product sales can commence. She hopes Lenox could assist with overcoming these hurdles, although Lenox suspects they aim to eliminate the weapons market monopolists in the area. He harbors reservations and tells Panwa that he doesn't understand what she means by her request. He asserts that a company like Dyke should have more than enough workforce, so he wonders why she would put in a request like this. Panwa reveals that there are two reasons. Firstly, Lenok is a freelancer who has gained popularity in the field faster than anyone else, mainly due to his proficiency as a mage. Secondly, hiring an outsider to do this permits them justification, which she deems the primary reason for seeking his assistance. When Lenok asks for an explanation, she urges that if they put their forces out there, they would come across all kinds of problems and restrictions. However, if they use Mage Van to take care of the obstacles indirectly, the rival companies won't be able to complain, at least not officially. Lenok contemplates that the 40s districts are basically an anarchy and wonders if the large businesses begin getting their hands on those districts, the order will collapse. That's not something the people of the city government would want. He grins, realizing they want him to use as a proxy to get rid of the rivals in the 40s districts, and asks Panwell what they will give him in return. Panwell remarks that she is aware of his request for something rare, so she presents Anakphil's five fingers, which the Central Council put in a VIP auction. She emphasizes that it's a single-use artifact that's not on the market and reveals that there are five evasion flight magic spells on the item, which were done by the Maladis school and it is not something you can just buy with money. Panwa hands him the contract paper and proposes a deal. If Lenok fulfills five of their requests, she promises to give him this artifact. Additionally, they will provide extra compensation for each completed task based on his value on the deep web. Meanwhile, Lenok reflects on the situation, recognizing his limited mobility and acknowledging that the artifact would compensate for this weakness. Therefore, he requests some time to consider the offer before making a decision. Later, Lenok discusses the deal with Jenny, who considers it a significant opportunity with equally significant risks and benefits. She acknowledges having some knowledge about the value of the Enochville's five fingers and speculates that if that's the reward, then the associated risks are likely considerable. Jenny concludes that Dyke's underlying aim is to undermine their competitors and seize control of the profits, warning Lenok that he'll inevitably make enemies if he agrees to this deal. Lenok concurs with Jenny's assessment, reflecting that his previous requests usually involve straightforward objectives or minimal repercussions. However, this particular task stands apart. The potential for retaliation from the weapons companies in the 40s district is considerable. Despite the risks, he realizes that achieving his desires cannot solely prioritize safety. He acknowledges that rare medicines and precious relics, which cannot be acquired with money alone, represent a higher ascent he must pursue. Understanding this, he instructs Jenny to inform them that he will accept the request. 
The next day, Jenny briefs Lennox on the first target Dyke chose is Paul Eckerman, who is based in the 48th District and has also invested a lot in legal weapons. Paul started two years ago and quickly obtained a commerce route and the business boomed. So Dyke's plan is to cut off the investor first. Jenny emphasizes that there were a lot of people talking because no one knew where Paul was getting his money from. However, there are rumors that he's the hands and feet of the Juice Master. She then asks Lennox if he knows who he is. He is the leader of the giant cartel, Dominic Cabarro, who has become famous on Pandemonium recently. She considers it likely due to that factor. She adds that even Paul Ackerman's bodyguard, Jude Russell, is formidable. He's a former war mercenary and is widely known among mercenaries for his strength and prowess. Jenny reiterates that Paul is Lennox's primary target, but Dyke has said there will also be an extra reward if he kills Jude Russell. She reveals that according to Intel, Paul Eckerman will hold a meeting with his distributors near the port in the 48th district. What Lennox ponders if it is trustworthy information, Jenny reassures him that she has double-checked, revealing that there are restrictions set on who enter the port area. Lennox then asks about the other people on the request, to which she informs him that there will be five people on this side. She assumes they chose people similar to Lennox in value and tells him that they are all scheduled to assemble in three days. Wrapping up her briefing, Jenny took a deep breath and informed him that was all the information Dyke had provided her. Lennox then gets up to leave, telling her that he has to start preparing since the mission is in three days. He thanks her for everything she has done for him. In response, Jenny smiles gently, hoping to see him again. Three days later, Dyke's appointed team consisting of five members including Lennox gathers around the port to target Paul Ackerman. One of the individuals donning a steel mask expresses certainty that they all heard the gist of the plan and asserts that she will tell them the details quickly to start their mission. The masked person explains that Paul Ackerman's soldiers have locked down the harbor and mentions there are precisely five entrances, coincidentally aligning with the number of members in their team. Each person will take an entry and bring down the soldiers before them, and then they will stand by the storage containers. She asserts that once the meeting place for Paul Ackerman and his distributors is decided, a part of us will proceed with a plan first, and the rest will join in. She then distributes communication devices, cautioning that the targets and their subordinates will disperse after tonight, so they must not hesitate to act swiftly. The masked girl then asks other team members why they didn't even think of covering their faces for this mission, asserting that Dyke may have much money, but won't ensure their safety. In response, the short-haired girl sarcastically asks if the steel-masked individuals don't work in this field. She emphasizes that they need to reveal their face and name in this field, whether they like it or not to increase their value. The other masked individual urges her not to get in their way as they depart. The giant man of the team asks the short-haired girl which way she will go, to which she sternly responds that it's none of his business and emphasizes that she will take care of her job alone. That guy then turns his focus to Lennox, remarking that he doesn't seem to be the physical combat type, commanding him to follow them to the harbor. He sternly urges that if Lennox makes it hard for them by being slow, he will rip out his appendages. Lennox doesn't respond and turns around, contemplating that he is tired of threats like this, considering it won't be too late to show that guy who is more robust later. With a count of three, they all get into action through a different entrance and knock down Paul's guards as much as possible through their preferred means. Lennox refrains from physically engaging the soldiers, choosing instead to unleash his magic against them. He reasons that since they are merely soldiers, they would likely be vulnerable to illusion magic, leaving them susceptible to his magical manipulation. When he notices that Paul Ackerman isn't present yet, he decides to lessen the number of soldier heads before Paul arrives. Employing his illusion spell, Lennox manipulates the soldiers' perceptions, creating auditory illusions and visual distortions, directing them toward a specific location. Using his mana-infused bullets, he overwhelms and incapacitates the disoriented soldiers. Moving on, Lennox continues to employ similar tactics against others present. Lennox continues to move around the area while the other team members issue instructions over the communication device, emphasizing that anyone who spots the target should report it immediately. Lennox considers that since he is here, he will begin. As he navigates among the cargo, he retrieves the charm acquired from Mila. While holding the charm, he reflects that using it would consume one of its limited uses. However, acknowledging Jude Russell's past as a warfare mercenary, Lennox speculates that Russell probably possesses exceptionally sharp senses. This motivates him to ready himself for potential encounters by contemplating the charm's utility. He employs it to remain concealed from him. While hiding behind a cargo, he notices some guys there, wondering if they are the distributors. Soon, a car halts near the distributors, and Paul Ackerman and Russell come out of it. Lennox immediately reports that Paul is in his area in Area F3. Paul greets his distributors with a broad smile, noting the perfect weather for discussing business, 
although the men around him appear visibly apprehensive. He places a hand on one of the men's shoulders, expressing gratitude for facilitating the meeting and emphasizing the importance of their discussion. He also mentions the difficulty he faced in arranging this opportunity. The fearful man anxiously asks what Paul means, as he doesn't understand his implications. Paul's tone shifts as he reveals his frustration, highlighting his extensive investments in money, gifts, and efforts to maintain favorable relationships with public servants to ensure smooth operations. Disappointed by the lack of reciprocation, Paul's frustration escalates, leading him to forcefully tighten his grip on the distributor's shoulder in a rage. As the man attempts to apologize, Paul reacts harshly by striking him and pushing him aside, subjecting him to a physical thrashing. He expresses his frustration angrily, berating the man for what he perceives as wasting his time and resources. The violent outburst sends shivers down the spines of the remaining distributors, instilling fear and apprehension among them. While observing the escalating situation, Lenok realizes he has called for his teammates but cannot stand idly by. Swiftly, he retrieves his gun, intending to initiate the first strike. Employing tactical maneuvers such as aim assist, along with cover-up techniques like spin-up acceleration and trajectory cover-up, he incorporates silence magic to conceal the sound of the shot. Lenok then aims at Paul, intending to fire without alerting others and directing the aim towards him. Nevertheless, just before the bullet finds its mark, Paul's vigilant bodyguard reacts swiftly, wielding his sword to deflect it, thus thwarting the danger. This abrupt twist in events ignites tension and panic among the distributors. Meanwhile, as the head of the distributors rushes to save himself, Russell persuades him and assassinates him for being a coward. In the heat of the moment, Paul ferociously commands the rest of them to take action against the intruder. Suddenly, everyone's attention is diverted to a surge of light, which catches Paul and his distributors off guard. Lenok realizes it is a laser attack that the steel-masked lady employed at the target. The lady, standing atop a cargo, remarks that getting rid of all the garbage at once was lucky and wonders if that concluded the mission. The short-haired girl approaches the lady and queries if she's making assumptions without even checking the corpses. She informs her that the attack didn't affect Jude Russell. The masked lady proposes moving forward, reminding the group of their original plan to eliminate Paul Ackerman and then leave. This prompts the short-haired girl to inquire whether the decision is being made solely by the masked lady. Meanwhile, Lenok, eavesdropping on their heated argument amidst the precarious situation, realizes the need to prepare for an additional attack regardless of their dispute. Conversely, the short-haired girl anxiously warns the masked lady that if she continues to act like this, she will complain to Dyke, as she must not think she is the only one getting special treatment for this case. Out of the blue, Russell intervenes by stabbing the short-haired girl, which catches them off guard and urges that ladies shouldn't be chatting so loudly this late, emphasizing that his client doesn't like it. Curious about Russell's infiltration, the masked lady wonders how he got through her detection radar. Russell casually wipes the blood from his sword with his tongue, mocking the masked lady's lackluster skills, highlighting that she failed to notice his presence until he attacked the girl. Tasting the blood, Russell remarks on its irritating flavor but concedes that for his first kill of the night, it's tolerable. Concealed behind the cardo, Lenok observes the sudden shift in events and ponders Russell's demeanor, particularly focusing on his blood sampling. He entertains the possibility that Russell could belong to the same ilk as the retired scavenger soldier, judging by his actions and mannerisms. As the lady attempts to attack, Russell remains unfazed. He casually remarks that she has an accurate modern arm there and sarcastically asks if she's a part of the Cybria Echo. Lenok is taken aback to hear Russell's claim about Cybria Echo, as it's a term that refers to types or organizations that push the limits of humankind by combining the human body and magic engineering. Lenok reflects on his past knowledge that they are not easy to encounter in real life, but now he guesses that wasn't true. On the other hand, Russell expresses disappointment, commenting that blood mixed with oil is messy, and firmly states that the masked lady is destined to die. Undeterred, the masked lady upholds her composure and readies herself to confront Russell. She suggests that it is actually Russell who really is backed into a corner, emphasizing that Paul Eckerman is already dead, and this ordeal will conclude once Russell meets the same fate. Russell sarcastically remarks that he doesn't think about that and tilts his head toward Paul Ackerman, standing down inside his magical shield unruffled by her prior laser attack. Paul asks if she thinks he wouldn't have known about the unwelcome guests coming today, catching the masked lady off guard. He adds that he even invited another guest, and with a snap of his fingers, he calls out the giant man who has deceived Dyke's group and comes up grabbing the other one of the masked individual's head in his hand. This revelation unsettles the masked lady as the giant man had initially pretended to be affiliated with Dyke's group at the beginning, causing a chill down her spine. Paul adds that she didn't think he could pay off the ones on her side and get them to act as traitors. 
He refers to them as idiots, asserting that Dykes should have known that nothing is impossible with money. Paul mocks her, stating that Dykes' mercenaries are so bad with their work, considering it's hilarious, and brandishes his gun at her. Paul reveals that he will open that mechanical head of hers and get all the information out before getting to her client. However, before he can take any action, Lenok intervenes and shoots Paul's head with his long-range barrel gun, rendering him dead. The unexpected presence of Lenok enrages the giant man who abruptly lunges to assault him. Meanwhile, as Russell attempts to kill the lady, Lenok realizes that Russell is planning to kill the woman first. So he plans to get rid of the giant man first. The giant man abruptly leaps, yelling if he is hiding all this time and refers to Lenok as a little rat, urging him not to think about running away. Lenok acknowledges that it is impossible to run away as soon as he reveals himself, so he prepares to defend himself by using a magic shield to block the impending attack as much as possible. The giant man forcefully strikes the shield, effortlessly shattering most of the layers, leaving Lenok bewildered. Lenok becomes aware that four of his shields have been destroyed, recognizing the formidable strength behind the man's punch, akin to that of heavy weaponry. Recognizing the danger, Lenok swiftly aims his gun at the assailant, deeming it a more effective solution in this challenging situation. He unleashes his aim assist and shock reinforcement maneuver, sending the assailant tumbling aside, wondering if it works. However, to his surprise, the assailant remains unfazed and comes back with a malicious grin and stern demeanor. He forcefully lunges at Lenok, asking if he thinks that a child's toy like that works on him, which catches Lenok off guard. The giant man radiates an overwhelming aura, boldly declaring his intent to obliterate Lenok with that toy. Amid this, Lenok becomes acutely aware of the impending peril. Realizing that if this assailant manages to breach the magic shield, his situation will become dire. Lenok quickly uses shock magic to dodge the attack. However, the forceful shockwave throws him off balance, sending him flying and crashing into a nearby container. As he tries to get up, the giant assailant sarcastically remarks that he thought Lenok was an idiot, but it looks like he has courage, and adds that his ancestors love courage like that. In this precarious situation, Lenox uses the Viper to regain his strength, and soon he discerns that the assailant's ancestor is helping him through necromancy. He realizes that the assailant is already formidable on his own, but with the additional boost from necromancy, he becomes even more powerful. While inhaling the Viper, Lenox assumes that if Jude Russell joined that giant man, it would be disadvantageous for him. He creates another magical shield, contemplating that he needs to figure out what happened with the Masked Lady and Jude Russell first. Conversely, the giant man reveals that, honestly, he would spare Lennox's life, as Lennox's actions inadvertently made his work much more accessible by sending Paul Ackerman's head flying. He mentions being already well compensated by both parties involved and believes that Lennox's actions have resolved the situation, eliminating the need for him to stir up more trouble with Dyke. It prompts Lennox to ponder whether the assailant's implication suggests that things will be fine if there are no witnesses. The giant man bursts into laughter and sternly agrees with Lennox's assertion. Lenok realizes that the man's true intentions are to get rid of all the witnesses and affiliate with Dyke again. Suddenly, his attention is diverted to Russell, and he is taken aback to see that the masked lady has managed to run away. He becomes bewildered that Jude Russell is coming this way to confront him. Lenox considers that to fight both of them, he has no choice but to use that method, and he abruptly starts hushing. The giant assailant barehandedly hoists the cargo, asserting where Lenox thinks he is going and refers to him as a bastard. Subsequently, he forcefully launches the colossal object toward him, but despite the immense threat, Lennox somehow manages to evade the incoming assault deftly. As the assailant persistently hurls cargo to impede Lennox's escape, Lennox finds it increasingly challenging to fend off the relentless attacks. He realizes that he can't run far with a cargo container hurtling dangerously towards him. With quick thinking, he swiftly deploys a magic bind, catching and diverting the cargo just in time. He runs swiftly and stops near an ocean while the giant assailant finds it funny and sarcastically remarks that he must be confident in his swimming skills. But it is not that easy to swim in an ocean at night. With the viper still in his mouth, Lenox inquires about the assailant's insinuation. The giant man asks if Lenox's frantic rush to the ocean's edge implies an intent to escape via the sea, questioning the reason for he has struggled to arrive here at full speed. Lenox turns around and asks whether the assailant believes anyone could survive in such weather conditions in the ocean. The giant man responds sarcastically, suggesting that Lenok, with a supposedly fragile body, wouldn't endure in such an environment. He tauntingly inquires if Lenok chose this place to meet his end melodramatically. Suddenly, Russell arrives and impressively cuts the cargo with his sword, catching their attention upon his arrival. The giant man mockingly asks if he chased that masked girl all the way here just to fail to kill her, and that's why he can't even protect his own client. 
Russell swiftly retorts, his voice firm, instructing the man to hold his tongue. He explains that Cybreed Echo was attempting to set up a biotransmission to aid her escape, leaving him in a challenging predicament. They then redirect their focus toward Lenok. Russell asserts that it looks like Lenok tried to run but failed, and he looks relatively calm, and asks if he has already accepted his death. Lenox claims that there is one thing he wants to know and ponders, that they have no reason to kill him as he assumes Russell's job is already over since his client is dead. Russell responds with a smirk, deeming Lenox's question irrelevant at this moment before his imminent death. He adds that even though his client is no longer alive, he still seeks revenge as Juice Master assigned him the task. While Juice Master might not directly punish him for losing one subordinate, he wouldn't simply let it slide. At that moment, Lenox comprehends the proof of Paul Ackerman's association with Juice Master. He muses that if Juice Master recruited both Russell and the giant man to safeguard his close subordinate, Paul Ackerman, their prowess, must be considerable. Sensing the urgency to neutralize the situation and prevent any additional chaos, Lenox takes a brief moment. Then he opens his eyes. Now glowing with a purple hue, Lenox stealthily activates reverse gravity, catching them off guard.